Please rise as the procession gets into the hall. Please kindly rise. Please sit. Good evening to you all here in the Great Hall of the University of Ghana. And though many who have joined us online would like to welcome you to today's inaugural lecture. This evening we gather here to outdoor yet another member of the University of Ghana community who has attained the rank of full professor. This evening's inaugural lecture will be delivered by Professor Kwesi Tope, Professor of Family Health, and he's also the Dean of the School of Public Health. He would be speaking to us this evening on the topic, Ending HIV AIDS in Africa, Reflections from the Clinic, Field, and Classroom. I would now like to welcome our Registrar, Mrs. Emile J. Mensa, to deliver welcome remarks and to introduce our chairperson for this evening's lecture. Please, let's welcome her. Good evening to you all. And I'd also like to welcome you to the Great Hall and to this evening's inaugural lecture to be delivered by Professor Kwesi Tope, Dean of the School of Public Health. And I also acknowledge all of those who are joining us online. Inaugural lectures are an essential component of the university's academic programs, and every academic who rises to the rank of professor 
in his or her career in the University of Ghana is expected to deliver an inaugural lecture. This offers the university the opportunity to recognize and showcase the academic achievements of faculty and also enables professors to share their research with colleagues within and outside the university and also to celebrate this important milestone with family and friends. I am now pleased to introduce the chairperson for today's inaugural lecture. Our chairperson is the first female vice chancellor of the University of Ghana. She's a professor of linguistics, an experienced administrator, and has over 20 years experience working in the higher education sector. She's a member of many prestigious societies and organizations, and is a fellow of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's the founding president of the African Humanities Association. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Professor Nanaba Pia Amfo, Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana and Chairperson for this evening's inaugural lecture. Thank you, Madam Registrar, for your introduction. Pro Vice Chancellors, Registrar, Provost, Deans and Directors, our distinguished lecturer, Professor Kwesi Tope, faculty, staff and members of convocation, past and present officers of the university, alumni and, friend, and students, family and friends of the lecturer, invited guests, members of the diplomatic corps, um, I see that we have uh, some members of the judiciary here as well as, as it of the police service, officers of the police, the Ghana police service, uh, eminent clergy if there are any, the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, those of you here in the Great Hall and those joining us across our various media platform, good evening to you. I warmly welcome you to Ghana's premier university, the Hill of Knowledge, University of Ghana, for the last in the series of inaugural lectures to be held this academic year. These lectures delivered by our distinguished faculty provide a platform for dissemination of research outcomes to members of the larger society. The inaugural lectures provide opportunities for academics who have attained the rank of professor to share insights from their teaching, practice, and research. This evening, we are privileged to celebrate another accomplished practitioner and academic at our esteemed university for the significant and impactful contributions he has made to his field of research and practice. This is also an opportunity for him to share with us valuable insights from his work over the years as he showcases the wide extent of his expertise and its relevance to our day-to-day -day existence. The lecture to be delivered by Professor Kwesi Tope shortly will throw more light on a very critical subject, one which we all have a collective duty to work towards. This evening, Professor Tope is speaking on ending HIV AIDS in Africa, reflections from the clinic field and classroom. Over the years, HIV AIDS have been a source of concern for several countries, particularly on the African continent. Since the beginning of the pandemic, governments, development partners, academic institutions, corporate, private and civil society organizations have continued to work towards eliminating HIV AIDS as a disease of public health concern. In 2022, the Joint United Nations Program on HIV AIDS, UN AIDS, uh, put out some numbers regarding people living with HIV AIDS in Ghana, those who have died from AIDS related causes, and newly infected persons. I will leave the details of the specific numbers to our lecturer. I'm sure that he will touch on that. Well, there's still a lot more we have to do if we have to achieve global targets on ending this pandemic. 
That said, it is a duty of individuals to acquire knowledge about the disease, its mode of spread, and how to curb it. Forming critical partnerships and collaborations between the different stakeholders involved in the space will immensely benefit the response and advance achievement so far. I'm sure we will hear more from Professor Tope, substantiated with the necessary scientific data. I would like to spe specially congratulate Professor Kwesi Tope for his contributions to institutional and national development. The entire university is proud of you and your accomplishment, and we doff our hearts in recognition of your resilience, dedication, and your colossal contribution towards academia. I heartily congratulate the Department of Population, Family and Reproductive Health, School of Public Health, and the College of Health Sciences for producing yet another professor. I believe this is a feather in the cap of the school and the college. Congratulations to you all. This academic year, we have had six inaugural lectures. Three of the six lectures have come from the College of Health Sciences. And And of these three lectures, two have come from the School of Public Health. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, allow me to introduce our distinguished lecturer, Professor Kwesi Tope, who will deliver this inaugural lecture from his expert viewpoint. And so I will do a shorter version of the profile. The full version is in the brochure, which is available both in hard copy and also in soft copy online. Professor Tope Kwesi Tope is a professor of family health and he's the dean of the University of Ghana School of Public Health. He has over 26 years experience as a physician, scientist, researcher, program director, and trainer. He received his MBCHP from the University of Ghana Medical School and his Master of Public Health in International Health from the Netherlands School of Public Health. He obtained his PhD at the Institute of Tropical Medicine at the University of Antwerp in Belgium. He's a fellow of the Ghana College of Physicians and the West African College of Physicians an honorary associate professor of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and an associate fellow of the Amsterdam Institute of Global Health and Development in the Academic Medical Center at the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. He's also the scientific chair for the International Conference on HIV Treatment pathogenesis and prevention research in resource limited settings interest. The first African to serve in that role. Professor Tope's work has focused largely on infectious diseases, particularly HIV, TB, hepatitis, and more recently COVID-19. Proud to joining the University of Ghana, Professor Tope had a long and distinguished career spanning over a decade working for the Family Health International, an international NGO based in the United States, with a mandate of implementing public health programs in various countries in Africa and Papua New Guinea. He worked with a wide range of clients, such as the United States Agency for International Development, United States Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, and many others. Professor Tope had provided technical support to country programs in HIV prevention, care, and treatment. He served as the clinical lead to design and implement the START program in Ghana. This is one of the first public sector HIV treatment programs in Africa and culminated in the access of HIV treatment in Ghana. He subsequently provided technical assistance in the expansion of HIV treatment in Zambia, Nigeria, and several sub-Saharan African countries. Professor Tope also served in the Ghana Police Service 
at the police hospital as a public health physician and a deputy head of the Ghana Police AIDS Control Program. Prof, I didn't know your police history till now. He was involved in early efforts to control HIV among the most at-risk population within the police. Professor Tope led the regional resource network at the Family Health International to identify, train and mentor young and promising Africans to take leadership roles in public health and HIV programming through the Accelerated Professional Development Initiative. He continued these efforts in Africa as a principal investigator for the World Health Organization Human Reproductive Program Alliance for Anglophone Africa based at the University of Ghana School of Public Health. This project offered 26 scholarships to African students, including 11 Ghanaians, to study for their master's and PhD here at the University of Ghana. He's also the site principal investigator for HIV comorbidities research training in Ghana, a collaboration between the University of Ghana and Yale School of Medicine funded by the National Institutes of Health, Health stroke Fogarty. Professor Tope has successfully won grants from the Ghana Health Service, the World Health Organization, Global Fund, World Bank, and the list goes on and on. Since 2016, he has, won, he has successfully won over 24 grants, totaling $10 million. And so that's an average of $1.5 million per year. And he's a principal investigator for a number of research studies and initiatives, including the rapid assessment of persons who use and inject drugs in Ghana, and the World Health Organization multi-country research study to assess content validity of a new sexual health-related survey instrument. Professor Tope has consulted for several organizations in different countries, and he has played a number of roles, including a member of a panel of aspects on Africa Build, a member on the Adult HIV Care and Treatment Expert Panel. At the national level, he is a member of the Governing Council of the Ghana AIDS Commission, Non-Communicable Disease Multi-Sectoral National Steering Committee, Ministry of Health Universal Health Coverage Task Force, the Ghana Health Service HIV Technical Working Group, and a few others. Within the University of Ghana, Professor Tope is a member of several statutory and ad hoc committees. He played a key role in HIV treatment in Ghana and Sub-Saharan Africa, translating clinical research findings into guidelines and policy to improve access to HIV testing, prevention of mother-to-child transmission, and clinical care. He originated the adherence support work, worker concept and task shifting outreach model in HIV, HIV care in Zambia, and he also introduced different implementation models in Kenya and Nigeria. Professor Tope has published over 100 peer-reviewed publications, over 70 peer-reviewed conference abstracts, three book chapters, and several technical reports. He has supervised 29 students at the master's level and 14 PhD students who have either graduated or defended their thesis and is currently supervising 12 PhD students who are at different phases of their studies. Professor Tope is the first recipient of the Dr. David Barry Prize for outstanding contribution to HIV treatment. He's married to Mrs. Juliana Tope, and they are blessed with three children, namely Guiana, Keith, and Albert. Ladies and gentlemen, believe it or not, this is the abridged version. (laughs) 
as I said, I encourage you to read the full version in the brochure. You can do so from the hard copy or there are soft copies available online. So distinguished ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Professor Kwesi Tope as he speaks to us on ending HIV AIDS in Africa, reflections from the clinic, field, and classroom. Thank you. Answer Professor Money, 
ya monya research ama mema ya ware scholars ene manso ya ware mema ya yes scholars ense mu mu o en trafie emu krata chre workshops conference and research dia ma mi juliana tope Money to we are going to show you what you say. And now, Rebecca say, "Any baby, any who a man who saw, any baby who saw, a man who ante and saw to be, because he, me the simple one, fly fly, who say, I can't do friends, I no party to to, any baby man, any, I plan who saw, can I do share your crowd?" E wi ase nyina ya krado e betia wo ya ya ma me so fa ya ba ani he fort me dise pre wo fre fre wo kwasi ma musu e ma musu sorry ma avla no aso Hello, colleagues. I bring you greetings from the Caribbean. Uh, Dr. Richard Amenya is my name. I am the UNAIDS multi country director in the Caribbean and I'm based in Jamaica. The history of HIV response in Ghana cannot be told without the contribution of Professor Kwesi Tope. His contribution has been profound especially in the area of the establishment of treatment programs as a public health uh, program in Ghana. This is something I say because I worked with him um, in, the years, in the early years of uh, the 2000s, 2001, 2002, where we both worked in Anya Kropo District. Um, St. Martin's, the Forest Hospital, and Atua Government Hospital um, in those days. I think Professor Kwesi Tope has been a great professional, a great coach, a great mentor for many HIV clinicians in Ghana. I have learned a lot from him, uh, done a lot of uh, brain work, brainstorming with, with him as to how to solve um, a challenge of getting people uh, to get onto treatment. Pesikope um, is a data-driven person. He uses data to inform his programs. And I think that was how I also got love uh, in public health. It's my honor to give a short tribute to Sir Pesikope, who takes on his new role at the University of Ghana School of Public Health. Since 2005, when we worked together in the HIV project, and then again we worked together in Nigeria, again on the HIV project. He is one of the best public health professionals I've ever worked with in my entire career. It's my honor to call him a friend, and I look forward to future coordination and collaboration in the future and continue our work.
Congratulations, Kwesi. It gives me good pleasure to speak about Professor Kwesi Topi. Kwesi, as we fondly call him. Kwesi, always full of energy. When Kwesi greets you, you, you even get, you get some of the energy, you know, Kwesi. Edward, that's the way we greet you in the morning. And um, it's, it's just uh, marvelous to relate with uh, someone like Kwesi. Um, when you want to summarize what Kwesi stands for, just say, uh, Kwesi is a great man. That's the summary that encapsulates um, the way he has mentored many of us, the way he takes particular interest in seeing you and in teaching you what he knows. He never holds back and he wants you to be, um, to be very, very professional and very, very humane in the way you approach others and in the way you approach work and deliver impact um, on, 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 on a day-to-day -day basis. I want to say congratulations to you today on your inaugural lecture. I wish on behalf of the department to congratulate Bob for achieving this height. This is another feather in the cap of the school. And working with Dr. Pei, I know he's very time conscious. He likes to get things done as quickly as possible. And the department recognizes your contribution to evidence and to policy in the field of HIV and AIDS in Ghana and especially this day that we have Prof. Tope delivering his inaugural lecture, I'd like to take the opportunity to congratulate him specially uh, and to say that he's been an inspiration and a source of pride for all of us. Uh, Prof. Tope will usually walk into my office uh, and just say, Bishop, uh, dear Neko, that always gives me a sense that yes, there's something to talk about. And I'm happy that indeed the pieces of advice that come every now and then is cherished and on behalf of the and again, congratulate you to emphasize that indeed you are a source of inspiration for all of us. On behalf of myself and the department as a whole, we want to associate ourselves with your inaugural lecture. And uh, we see, as I personally affectionately call you, because we've had a very long history since our undergraduate days here in the University of Ghana. And uh, you have established yourself very strongly in the area of HIV and AIDS. And on this occasion, I would like to express my personal congratulatory message to you, and also on behalf of the staff and the students of the department. Thank you. Start by congratulating Sadhguru for a great job done in achieving his heights. I've known him for a very long time now. We all came here in uh, 1989 90 to start the uh, first degree. And uh, as you see him today, he was like that. Uh, he's a man of action. And I'm not surprised he's been able to come uh, this far. Uh, I want to congratulate him again. Uh, now, we all know he's our dean, the uh, dean of School of Public Health. I will be my wish is that use that vim he is had in him to push everybody in the school to climb up and possibly get to where he has gotten to all the best in the future undertakings. Thank you. I'm very excited to celebrate you for the topic on your inaugural lecture. We at the department are very excited because we know that you are really a champion for us and you have been one of the pillars in the last few years for our programs in the department. One of the things that the students always say is whenever Prof. Tope meets you, he says, are you finishing your dissertation? And, and really this is one of the things that we really like about you. You are a go-getter and you get things done. And so on this occasion, we really celebrate you. I met Prof. Kwesi while working with FHI 360 in a technical review meeting. And from a 30 minutes meeting, the impact has been felt in my life since then immensely. His straightforward approach, passion, and vast knowledge have shaped me into the person I am today. He believed in me, unlocking my potentials, and instilling a profound sense of purpose. I learned humility, the power of listening without judgment, and the importance of resilience to maximize my impact. 
and strive to make a meaningful impact, just as he did for me and countless others whom I am working with. Thank you, Prof. Professor C. situations. Professor Shinnan. So proud of your young alma mater for the recognition given you. I have had three enduring encounters with Professor Topi. The first was when we were all medical students at School. Time, its intellect, and leadership were already powerful. Its greatness and its future. Second encounter occurred at an HIV conference in 2009. At the time, he was working with Family Health International. And I was so uh, impressed with his evidence based status and knowledge of HIV, and his commitment to meditation science. The third encounter was when he returned back to the to faculty. I tapped into him, started a collaboration, currently have the research training grant of China. In summary, Professor Christy Tope is a consummate clinician scientist, a triple threat, service, education, and research excellence. Have you worked with Prof for close to two years? A such a nice man, when you approach him for something within a, 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 his reason that he can do, he doesn't procrastinate, he starts from there. And if it is something beyond his doing, he will tell you Frank that for this I cannot do. And this is one of the qualities that I like about him. He, he really listens to people and responds to them accordingly. So on this note, I want to congratulate Prof on his appointment and pray that God continue to bless him continue to protect him and that what he's doing you continue to do it and do it more. Thank you so much. Uh, it's very kind. I mean whenever you meet you, call you, meet you, it's more social to everyone, not only his colleagues, but all of us. Everybody in the others doing this, everybody in the in the national service, all of them. I mean very I've come to know Prof. Chrissy Tope over the past one year, and I must say that if there was a persona that exemplified what true leadership is or what servant leadership is, I would gladly be waiting for that position. Prof. Chrissy Tope has opened his doors to us as students, and every time we go, he has an audience for us. He just hasn't been our lecturer, but he has also become a father figure to us. And a perfect robot, I should say. And over the years, between the student body and the school leadership, through the ups and downs, trust me, he's always been there and has fought for us every step of the way. So on this day of his inauguration as a full professor of the University of Ghana, trust me, all your children of the School of Public Health want to say a hearty congratulations to you. You've earned it, you deserve it, and there's nobody that we could have been prouder of for this moment. God wish you bless you, even as you start a new journey of professorship. Thank you. I know Dr. Percy Tope has had a very profound effect. I enjoyed working with him, and he hasn't stopped in this fight of ending the AIDS epidemic. He is a man who has passion for his work, and one thing that I think the world of public health would thank him for was a paper he wrote in the area of sustainability. And this paper has been heavily quoted uh, by especially the donors who really uh, are now focusing a lot more on programs of sustainability and we see was ahead of the curve in terms of making sure that we documented uh, the different approaches of sustainability. Local production was something that he started talking about early in the day, you know, and, and, and I think working with Professor Pesitope has been wonderful and I'm happy that he's celebrating his inaugural address. It's been wonderful working with Pesi, and uh, congratulations, Pesi Tope, uh, in your quest to end the AIDS epidemic on the African continent.
and contributed to ending AIDS as a public health threat um, globally. Thank you so much for your work. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Vice Chancellor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Oster Crunchy. Madam Vice Chancellor, Pro Vice Chancellors, Provosts, Registrar, Members of Convocation, Clergy, Members of the Society for AIDS in Africa, Distinguished Invited Guests, Students, Ladies and Gentlemen here in Gathered and also online. I'm indeed humbled by the introduction and the great opportunity offered by this platform. For today, I hope to gain more recruits in our quest to end AIDS in Africa. Now, the outline of my presentation would be as follows. I'll go through a brief introduction, and then we'll get into the origins of HIV. Then we'll look at the HIV treatment in Ghana and in Africa. Then we'll look at the vertical transmission of HIV, and then get into HIV and health systems. And then I'll try to end with the future direction of HIV and then I will conclude. It has been a long, difficult, yet fulfilling and rewarding career in global health. Several people have contributed to the different phases of my personal and professional career, particularly my family, and I will appropriately acknowledge them later. However, I want to recognize two important personalities who launched me into a career of public health and infectious diseases in Ghana and in the international arena. The first is Professor Peter Lamte. <laughs> Professor Peter Lamte then in 2001 was Vice President of Family Health International in the US. He later became the President and currently he's President Emeritus of FHI 360. He offered me the opportunity to work in the area of global health. He successfully convinced the FHI 360 board then to provide an amount of $1 million from its own resources, its own corporate funds, to start HIV treatment in Ghana, Kenya, and Rwanda. As a young physician, then working with the Ghana Police Hospital, I did have some experience in HIV treatment, given that uniform services were a population at risk of HIV. So from the police hospital and the Ghana Police Service, I joined Family Health International as a senior clinical officer to lead the clinical team to operationalize the introduction of HIV treatment in Ghana. My passion and enthusiasm to learn made up for my limited experience. Peter offered me a dream job where I was able to practice as a physician, conduct research, implement public health programs, and serve as a trainer, all rolled into one. I could not ask for more. Under Peter's tutelage, I learned the act of survival, making a difference and impact in the global health space. These include using limited available resources to generate strong program results and outcomes. These strong results will then become a collateral for raising more money for program implementation and thereby improving the lives of our people. It is living the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, 14 to 18 in public health. We are to invest wisely and offer back to the Lord what he has given us in the first place. This principle has been an important cornerstone of my professional career. Starting from a $1 million project here in Ghana to over $440 million project in Nigeria, this principle has remained unchanged. We need to use the resources that we have wisely and efficiently and achieve the best outcomes and improve the lives of the people that we serve. The second person I would like to talk about is Professor Robert Kolobandes. Professor Robert Kolobandes is a professor of infectious disease and one of the foremost HIV physicians in the world. At that time, he was in the Institute of Tropical Medicine and the University of Antwerp in Belgium. Through their collaboration with Family Health International, he came to Ghana at the turn of the century 
to support the HIV treatment program in Ghana. He later offered me a PhD position in his institute in Antwerp. He paid my first year school fees from his own resources and offered me a teaching appointment in the short course in HIV treatment to enable me to fend for myself during my times in Antwerp. He taught me and mentored me in infectious diseases, particularly HIV and TB, clinical management, epidemiology, and research. As a poor African student who has successfully defended his PhD thesis in Antwerp with a few relatives around, Bob sought funding from some benevolent organizations to organize a surprise reception and dinner after my oral defense. One of the greatest gifts that Bob passed on to me was making me a better physician scientist, a writer, and an academic. These two personalities have shaped my professional trajectory in the area of public health and infectious diseases. Peter and Bob, I'm truly grateful. And Bob is online, and I think Peter is also here. Now to the topic for the day. So I'll talk about HIV globally. Now the first case of HIV was identified in the early 1980 in Los Angeles in the USA with patients showing evidence of immunosuppression. In 1981, the syndrome, human immunodeficiency syndrome, was actually described. And the virus was subsequently identified in 1983. Now, the types of HIV. There are two types of HIV, HIV-1 and HIV-2. HIV-1 is predominantly found around the world, everywhere, in almost every country. Now, in addition to that, HIV-2 is found in the West Africa region. So, in the West Africa region, we have both HIV-1 and 2. Now, um, in Ghana, HIV-1 accounts for about 98% of uh, uh, the infections, whilst HIV-2 alone or, uh, or with HIV-1 accounts for the rest. Now, HIV is not homogeneous. There are different types, we call it clades, of HIV-1. So, we have what we call the main group, the group M. Now, within the group M, we have a, a subtype A, subtype B, subtype C, D, and it goes on. And then, in addition to that, we have what we call recombinance. So recombinants are these subtypes actually mixing together to form something like AE, AF. So um, these recombinants actually, uh, you would find them, some of them here in Ghana. Now the clade B, that's the subtype B, is common in the USA and in Europe. And then the, the clade C is common um, in the East and Southern Africa. Now to uh, the origins. Now, viruses related to HIV-1 actually have been isolated from the common chimpanzee and several monkey species. So, and then also, the virus related to HIV-2 actually have been isolated from what we call the Suti Mangabe. The Suti Mangabe is a large monkey found in the west coast of uh, Africa from Senegal through Liberia, Sierra Leone, Cote d'Ivoire, and Ghana. It is also found in Burkina Faso and Guinea. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tend to address the controversies on the origin of HIV, which ranges from several conspiracy theories to an act of God. Now, simian immunodeficiency virus infection in humans has been documented by Marcia Kalish in an emerging infectious disease uh, publication in 2005 among the Central African hunters. Now, among the Central African hunters, they showed a prevalence of 17.1% in those who were most exposed. And the most exposed are those who hunted, butchered, or kept monkeys and chimpanzees. Even though HIV was uh, isolated in 1983, there is strong evidence that the virus was in human population long before then. Michael Wurobe, a professor of evolutionary biology in the University of Arizona in the US, has researched and published several articles on the origins of HIV. Actually, he has provided us more knowledge in this area. Now, in a paper published by David Ho 
in Nature, Nature is a scientific journal, they described the first documented case of HIV that was in a Bantu man. That was in 1959 in Leopoldsville. Leopoldsville is now known as Kinshasa. In the then Belgian Congo. The HIV sample actually looked like an ancestor to several HIV subtypes around the world. This patient had gone to the clinic with symptoms of what resembled sickle cell disease. He also had um, glucose phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency and, of course, the sickle cell treats. The doctor stored the blood sample. This sample was later analyzed by David Ho and his team. The second case, documented case, is a review of a lymph node sample taken and stored in the University of Kinshasa in 1960. Analysis revealed that she was infected with HIV. This was compared to the earlier sample found in the Bantu man, and the, the difference in the uh, genetic sequencing was 12%. In addition to this, materials were obtained between 1971 and 1976 from a Norwegian family who showed the evidence of HIV prior to 1971. Now, study of the archived samples in U.S., Haiti, Democratic Republic of Congo has helped our understanding on the earlier origins of HIV. The return of the Haitians from Congo after independence from Belgium in 1960 is an important milestone for the possible entry of the virus into the Americas. Based on the mutation rate, the mutation rate is how the virus changes. Based on the mutation rates, divergence between HIV 1 and 2, and then also the genetic dating techniques. It could be extrapolated that the virus had been evolving 40 to 50 years. So basically, which means the virus entered the human population between 1910 to 1930. And actually, some scholars argue it happened 10 years earlier. The question is, why did we recognize HIV only in the 80s? when it was already infecting humans much earlier. It is believed that when the virus jumped into humans, it did not become an epidemic because of the population density, low population density, and it was also in a rural setting. In addition, when it started spreading, it was not recognized due to the lack of diagnostic capacity. However, globalization accelerated its spread and subsequent recognition. Now, the, there are 39 million people living with HIV today. 20.8 million of them are in East and Southern Africa. 4.8 million are in West and Central Africa. The UNAIDS update in 2023 estimates that a life is lost every minute due to HIV. This is equivalent to 650,000 HIV-related deaths. In addition, there are 4,000 new infections daily. Every week, every week 4,000 adolescent girls and young women get infected, and 84,000 children died of HIV last year. Sub-Saharan Africa accounts for 51% of all new infections. 76% of uh, people living with HIV would manage to put them on treatment. Unfortunately for children, we have only managed to put 57% on treatment. Now, to give you an appropriate context about the different uh, epidemiology across Africa, in terms of the burden of disease, Nigeria has a prevalence of 1.3, Ghana, 1.66, so about 1.7, Cote d'Ivoire, 1.9. Now, if we move to Central Africa, Cameroon, is 2.9 percent. Democratic Republic of Congo, 0.7 percent. Now we travel to East Africa, Kenya is 4 percent. Tanzania is 4.5 percent. Uganda is 5.2 percent. Now to Southern Africa, Zambia is 10.8 percent. Botswana is 18 percent. South Africa is 18.3 percent. Lesotho is 20.9% and 
and Eswatini, that's formerly Swaziland, is 27.9%. So this gives you a context of the prevalence of HIV around our continent. In 2002, the HIV treatment project called START was birthed. This was a collaboration between uh, Family Health International and the Ministry of Health. The funding to start HIV treatment in St. Martin's Hospital in Agomeni, and Atua Government Hospital, uh, the funding was to start treatment in these two hospitals. Now, following the overwhelming success of the pilot program, the then UK Department of International Development moved in to support the program. And I must say, my good friend, Dr. Vita Bompu, who was then working with the Department of International Development, played a key role in this. Subsequently, the national program secured funding from USAID, Global Fund, and the World Bank. The success was attributable to the leadership of the Ministry of Health and Ghana Health Service and commitment of healthcare workers, health facilities, use of evidence-based approaches. Now, some of the key highlights in Ghana were as follows. First, Professor William Ampo, our own colleague here, and I led a team from Noguchi and Family Health International about 22 years ago to determine the normal CD4 in a Ghanaian. CD4 is a blood cell. It shows the level of immunity uh, in, a, in, a, in a person. And if you have HIV, your CD4 level will go down. So we actually determined the level in the normal Ghanaian. So we went to look at people who were HIV negative and then checked out their CD4 count. And uh, we found that the average, the mean for CD4 for the Ghanaian was around 1,067. And this was actually consistent with what others have found in other countries, which was ranging between 500 and 1,500. But the interesting thing is that we also found a subpopulation of people who were HIV negative but had CD4 count very, very low, some of them as low as 200. In addition to that, in collaboration with the colleagues from Madrid, Spain, we also found out that the, the virus in this country was the recombinants. And the good thing was that these recombinants were still susceptible to the HIV drugs that we had introduced. Another important lesson was about HIV-2. As I mentioned earlier, HIV-2 is unique in the West Africa region. So in the early days, we were offering drugs, and their names are a bit technical, Zidovudine, Lamivudine, Nevirapine, and Fibrinase as our first line. Now, these drugs, these three drugs are effective in treating HIV-1, but only two of them can treat HIV-2. So I vividly recall one of my patients who was doing very well on treatment, but later started deteriorating. We checked on the adherence, we asked the patient, are you taking your pills? And she swore she took her pills every day. And at that time, viral load machine, the viral load machine is the machine that you use to count the, uh, the, viral, the, the, the number of virals in the blood. It was not readily available. So we took the samples and then we brought it to Noguchi for viral load assessment. And now, it's interesting to know that, you know, I mentioned HIV-1 and then HIV-2. The viral load machines that are commercially available was only for HIV-1, because clearly HIV-2 was just restricted in our region, the West Africa sub-region. So, it was generally difficult to do HIV-2 uh, viral loads. Fortunately, at that time, a company in Sweden had donated a, a KVD machine, which could actually... Uh, do HIV-2 viral loads. So we managed to do that in Noguchi. And what we found out was that this patient had a very high HIV-2 viral load. So what we did was we changed the treatment and gave drugs that could treat HIV-2. And then she got better. Now the presence of HIV-2 taught us an important lesson. So we had to make changes to the national testing algorithm. And uh, for those of you who have been involved in HIV, the last test would always have to determine whether the patient has HIV-1 or HIV-2. And depending on what they have, then you can give the appropriate treatment. Fortunately, we have moved on. The drugs that we use today are both effective for, against HIV-1 and 2. The other thing that we learned very quickly was clinical staging. Because we really did not have um, uh, resources for a lot of the laboratory work, 
the patient will come, you examine and you do what you call clinical staging. So if the patient doesn't have uh, any symptoms, then that person is stage one. If the person is very sick, then stage four. So we use the clinical staging. But we decided to conduct research to determine how efficient this clinical staging was. So we took um, uh, blood samples for CD4. And one of the things we realized is that people in the urban areas, particularly in the middle class, when they come, they look very, very well. But when you check their CD4 count, it's extremely low. And then, again, when you go to the rural areas, we're seeing people who came and looked sick, but their, their, their CD4 counts were moderate. So basically, what this told us was that clinical staging alone, even though important, had its limitations. So it was important that you include laboratory uh, investigations to efficiently identify the patients who need treatment. So our experiences in treating uh, persons living with HIV allowed us to develop practice guidelines on the management of side effects like anemia, uh, damage to the nerves, that's peripheral neuropathy, damage to the liver, hepatotoxicity, among others. So antiretroviral therapy made a huge difference in the lives of individuals. There was a reduction in mobility and mortality. It was clear to many of us that our patient level strategies at the clinic was effective. It was uncommon to find patients dying whilst on treatment. However, many persons living with HIV did not have access to treatment. So although we did an excellent job in providing quality HIV care in Ghana, this approach was going to be labor intensive and expensive in countries where the prevalence was high or the population was very high. We needed a radical change in mindset to transfer the benefits of observed at the clinic level to the population. This influenced our strategies, particularly in the eastern and southern Africa region, as well as in Nigeria. And it marked an important transition in my career as I moved from uh, 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 Family Health International in Ghana to assume an international role. We embarked on a journey to move the lessons we have learned from Atua, St. Martins, Kolebu, Konfuanochi, and a few private clinics in Accra to the population level to improve saving, to improve access to life-saving HIV treatment in sub-Saharan Africa. I take pride in the quote of Duke Ellington, and it states, a problem it's a chance to do your best. Working in countries with higher burden and access, access challenges was a problem that required creativity and innovation. Availability of trained human resources, particularly doctors, nurses, laboratory staff, and other health workers is one of the biggest challenges facing access to health as well as the quality of service that we deliver. In Zambia, we pioneered and implemented the concept of adherence support workers to address these human resource challenges. Adherence support workers are persons living with HIV who we train to offer adherence counseling and also follow up patients. We did this so that we could relieve the pressure on the nurses and other healthcare workers. And we were able to demonstrate scientific evidence that adherence counseling provided by these adherence support workers was comparable to that uh, provided by nurses, and we published this work. Again, we are able also to demonstrate that uh, HIV testing conducted by lay providers was also comparable to that done by nurses. And this was a watershed moment as we provide more scientific evidence for task shifting. You know, doctors, nurses, laboratory staff are very territorial. So you really have to show the evidence before you can implement a program like this. So together with colleagues in the UK, we conducted a systematic review on the role and outcomes of community health workers in HIV care in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is actually one of my most cited publications. And our um, published works on human resource for health accelerated efforts to expand access to HIV services through task shifting across sub-Saharan African countries.
We did not leave the deprived communities out. We implemented access related strategies like the outreach model where we move into the uh, community. We also implemented a sample referral where samples are moved from the periphery to the hubs, uh, the health facilities. And this allowed many more people to access services. We even went ahead in Nigeria, we actually developed a community antiretroviral therapy model where we offered treatment outside the health facility. And again, we published our work. So typically, when you want to get patients on HIV treatment, it takes between two weeks to one month. I mean, working them up and then preparing them properly. But in the process of waiting, some of the patients die, and then you lose some of them. So the global guidelines later recommended that patients should be started on treatment the same day. So that's what we call the same day initiation to treatment, just to address the bottleneck of the delays and then the attrition. Unfortunately, our experience with same day initiation was associated with high loss to follow up in the first 30 days. So we tried this in Nigeria and we had a very strong program and all of a sudden we started losing a lot of our patients. And because same day uh, initiation was a very good thing which we had to do, we had to come up with an approach to solve this challenge. So we conceived the idea of what we call the adherence calendar. So the adherence calendar is a model where when you prepare the patients and then they go back uh, the first week, the second week, we have specific days that you reach out to the patient either in person or through um, phone calls to check out on them, counsel them and support them. And when we did this, there was a dramatic reduction in the loss to follow up rate. Now I want to talk about an area that is very close to my heart, vertical transmission of HIV. That is a prevention of mother to child transmission. HIV in children is a blot on the conscience of humanity. This is because we have the knowledge and the strategies to eliminate HIV in children. Vertical transmission can take place during pregnancy, labor, and delivery, and also during the breastfeeding period. In 2021, 160,000 new infections occurred among children, and 85% of these were occurred in sub-Saharan Africa. Treatment to prevent mother-to-child transmission has evolved in the last 20 years from single dose nevirapine, which was a pill, to now a triple regimen that contains drugs, that, uh, namely tenofovir, lamivudin, and dolutagravir. Now, to optimize elimination of HIV in children, the bottleneck in the mother-to-child transmission cascade must be removed. Young women must have access to HIV prevention tools to stay negative. HIV positive, Young women should also have access to family planning services to prevent unintended pregnancies. Those who attend antenatal care must receive HIV testing, and those who test positive must receive antiretroviral drugs. Mothers who have been HIV negative earlier in the pregnancy must be retested before they deliver. Infants from mothers who are positive in pregnancy must also receive prophylaxis at birth. They must also be tested to determine whether they are HIV infected or not. Any weakness in any of these steps will perpetuate HIV in children. In 2005, in one of my earlier studies, my team and I conducted in 38 health facilities in five provinces in Zambia. Only 45% of all women attending antenatal clinic were tested for HIV. And out of those who tested positive, only 29% received a full course of antiretroviral therapy. The challenges include, included lack of human resource capacity, same-day testing, stigma and discrimination, among others. We designed interventions to address these specific challenges. Within 18 months, 
99% of women attending antenatal clinic received an HIV test. And 100% of those who were positive received antiretroviral drugs. In an observational study, in 28,320 HIV positive mothers and the infants um, from 317 facilities and 40 districts in Zambia, and we published this again in PLOS One. And this is one of the biggest MTCT data sets that you ever find. We observed that HIV transmission was lowest among, uh, uh, among those where the mother and baby both received prophylaxis, and highest among those who did not receive, who did not attend the antenatal clinic. In addition, mothers who received three drugs were less likely to transmit HIV to their babies compared to those who received two drugs. Women who pr practiced misfeeding, that is breastfeeding plus uh, formula, were likely to transmit HIV to their babies. We conducted similar studies in uh, Kenya and Malawi, and it confirmed this fact. Now, majority of the women that we screen in the, our antenatal clinics will actually turn out post negative. Most of them are negative. So typically in Ghana, if you screen 100, 98 will be negative, and then two will be positive. Unfortunately, the 98 who will be negative, if you don't track them, some of them actually convert and become positive. We say they seroconvert and become positive. And, and when that happens, we know that a woman who seroconverts during the pregnancy has four times is more likely to transmit to the baby compared to those who were diagnosed at first and put on treatment. So HIV retesting among seronegative mothers is essential to elimination. Nigeria at one point accounted for a third of new HIV cases among 21 priority countries. In an almost military-like operation over a period of 10 months, we expanded PMTCT services to an additional 2,044 facilities in eight priority states, increasing facility coverage from 8% to 50%, and then also 152% um, increase in antiretroviral uptake. And I must say, uh, my good friend, Dr. Edward Oladele, uh, he is the country rep for FHI 360 in Zambia. I was working with him in Nigeria, and he's actually in this room with us. And then Dr. Shimu Asala, also from Nigeria, he was part of this team. Fortunately, these interventions, among others, have reduced Nigeria's contribution in terms of HIV in children. The next frontier of eliminating HIV among children is looking at the women who are negative throughout the whole pregnancy but become positive during the breastfeeding period. This is because when they become positive, it's extremely difficult to identify them and you only realize when the children are infected. So we need to have interventions to try and identify HIV among breastfeeding women. And we know the tools. Uh, testing of uh, uh, breastfeeding women when they come for the uh, child welfare clinic, and as well as giving post-exposure, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis to um, women who are at substantial risk of uh, developing HIV. The recent 2003 UNAIDS publication shows that in East and Southern Africa, new infections in children are occurring in mothers who acquire HIV during the pregnancy and then breastfeeding period, as well as those who, did not, who were diagnosed but did not take their drugs, and then also mothers who did not receive treatment at all. Now, when you move to West and Central Africa, the picture is different. The new infections are coming from um, women who did not receive HIV treatment in pregnancy. So these women did not access services at the health facility. So access to services uh, for pregnant and breastfeeding mother is a major barrier that we have to address in West and Central Africa sub-region. Ghana has introduced HIV babies tool for auditing purposes. If appropriately implemented, 
This will enable us to understand why our babies are getting infected. And whether the mothers attended antenatal clinic and did not receive ARVs, or received ARVs but did not adhere to the drugs, or seroconverted um, during the uh, breastfeeding period. Botswana has shown us that we can eliminate HIV in children with the right strategies. Botswana is the first country, first high HIV burden country to be certified for achieving the silver status on its path to elimination, mother to child transmission of HIV. Botswana is also on track to attain the gold status. It is clear to me that HIV children in Africa, it is clear to me that we can eliminate HIV in children in Africa if we implement the right strategies. Now I'll turn to HIV testing. HIV testing is the gateway to care. In Western Central Africa, 18% of people living with HIV do not know their status. This translates to 864,000 people. And out of this, Ghana accounts for about 100,000. In East and Southern Africa, 8% of persons living with HIV, representing 1.7 million, do not know their status. So for us to end HIV AIDS, we need to and identify the, uh, the undiagnosed through smart, efficient, and targeted testing. This will include index testing, provider-initiated testing, use of screening tools, among others. For countries that have made a lot of progress in HIV testing, there is something we call recency testing. Recency testing may be an option that will allow you to identify those who are newly infected because they know those who are newly infected transmit the infection much more. Then I'll get into another area and uh, I'll crave your indulgence, uh, my parish priest, because at this point I'll talk about sex. So key populations. Key populations are defined groups who due to specific higher risk behaviors are at increased risk of HIV, irrespective of the epidemic type or the local context. Also, they often have legal and social issues related to their behaviors that increase their vulnerability to HIV. The key populations are important to the dynamics of HIV transmission. The UN AIDS describes five main key populations, and they are as follows. Sex workers. When we say sex workers, it's both male and female sex workers. Men who have sex with men and transgender people. In addition, we have persons who inject drugs and prisoners, prisoners and other incarcerated people. So these groups form the key populations. Now the key populations account for less than 5% of the world's population but 70% of new infections in 2021. In sub-Saharan Africa, 49% of the new infections among, is among the general population, 41% is among sex workers, clients of sex workers, and their sexual partners, men who have sex with men as well. In terms of relative risks, a person who injects drugs is seven times, has uh, seven times, um, the risk is higher. Then uh, among the sex workers is four times, among men who have sex with men is 11 times, and among the transgender is 14 times. So because these populations are considered different by members of the society, including health workers, they are subject to violence, arrest, detention, stigma, and discrimination. And this limits their access to health services, both at the facility level and then the community level. Now, I want to share with you some principles of uh, infectious diseases and particularly sexually transmitted diseases. There's a paper that was published in the Lancet uh, Journal a quarter of a century ago by the late Ward Kate and uh, Gina Dalabeta. These are both colleagues, senior colleagues uh, from Family Health International. So we have what we call the core transmitters. So typically, the population at the highest risk usually would have high prevalence. 
Now, for the infection to get into the general population, you need what we call a bridging population. You need a bridging population. And if you want to use um, female sex workers as an example, if you look at female sex workers, the data in Ghana shows that 71% of people who go and have sex with the female sex workers use condom. 29% do not use it. Now, female sex workers have what we call um, intimate partners or non-paying partners. They have boyfriends who have sex and they don't pay. Now, those who have sex and don't pay, in terms of condom use, is only 23.5%. So it means 70 something percent, they do not use condoms. Now, these people have wives, they have girlfriends. So they form a bridge and then they take it into the general population. Now, the girlfriend also has a boyfriend. And then the boyfriend also has a girlfriend. And it goes on and on. And we've done a lot of sexual network mapping. And it's amazing to see who is sleeping with who. So, but the good thing is that HIV, we have made good progress. Anybody who is infected and is on treatment and the viral load is undetectable has an almost zero chance of transmitting the infection. So the risk, if you take your uh, treatment, is almost zero. So this is what we call U equals U. Uh, undetectable is equal to untransmissible. But then, access to healthcare is a key strategy. If these people don't have access to healthcare, then that is a problem that we need to deal with. Limiting access to healthcare for key populations, for me, is a monumental mistake. As an HIV physician, I can confidently say, without equivocation, that ending AIDS in Africa will be a pipe dream if we do not make deliberate and intentioned efforts to improve access of key populations to health services. This is a public health imperative. Data has shown that when we make the effort to improve access, the results will be there for all to see. The female sex worker story in Ghana is an example. The National HIV STI Control Program, the Ghana AIDS Commission, the West African Program to Combat AIDS, the Global Fund, USAID and other civil society partners have done a lot of work in this area. We have seen prevalence of HIV amongst female sex workers decline from 11.1% in 2011 to 7% in 2015 and 4.6% in 2020. In fact, the 2020 study was conducted by our team from the School of Public Health and the Noguchi Institute for Medical Research. And even within that data set, we actually observed a lower HIV prevalence among the younger sex workers. This we consider a very positive development. Among men who have sex with men, the aggregate HIV prevalence marginally increased from 17.5% in 2011 to 18.1% in 2016. It is important to know that about half of men who have sex with men also have sex with women. This is important for programming purposes because the female partners are potential bridge population. HIV among people who inject drugs is an area where there have been very limited studies. My friend and colleague, uh, Professor Edusa Akodie and his team in KNUST studied the vulnerability of men and women who use drugs. Recently in 2002, my team conducted a study covering four regions in Ghana. We found that drugs being commonly used were cocaine, heroin, tramadol, and pethidine. Whilst usage of cocaine and heroin were common in the southern part of the country, tramadol was more prevalent in the northern regions. We also found an HIV prevalence of 2.5% among persons who use and inject drugs. Unfortunately, the prevalence was 12.7% among women who injected drugs and 17.7% among women who injected drugs 
and who were also sex workers. Whilst the prevalence of hepatitis C was comparable in the general population, we actually found two clusters in the greater Accra region with very high prevalence of hepatitis C. These results point to a simple fact. Ghana is at the cusp of an outbreak of HIV and bloodborne infections among people who inject drugs. The passage of the Narcotic Control Commission Bill Act 1019 to treat drug dependence as a public health threat as a public health issue rather than focusing on law enforcement, incarceration and punishment is a major achievement for this country. The next step is to develop a harm reduction program for persons who use and inject drugs. I will now turn into HIV and aging. Aging or growing old is a fact of life. But who is considered old? The definition of old is not standardized as aging is a continuous process. In the general population, without HIV, different cutoffs exist, so 60 years, other places 65 years. However, in persons living with HIV, the cutoff is generally considered to be around 50 years. Globally, the proportion of aged persons living with HIV actually doubled from 8% in 2000 to 16% in 2016. The number of aged persons living with HIV in sub-Saharan Africa is expected to triple by 2040. In Ghana, 34% of persons living with HIV were aged more than 50 years, as of June 2022. A retrospective study that we conducted here in our own Kolubu Teaching Hospital shows that 37% of our HIV patients are aged, and almost half of them had at least one comorbidity, with hypertension being the most prevalent, followed by diabetes and then uh, lipid abnormalities, that dyslipidemia. Now, integration of HIV and non-communicable disease is really not a choice, but a necessity. We would have to, if we have to end uh, the AIDS epidemic. We have designed uh, integration models based on our work in Kenya, Zambia, and Nigeria where non-communicable diseases can be integrated both at the facility and in the community. Professor Peter Lamte, my good self, and other colleagues from FHI 360 actually developed a discussion paper on how to include prevention and control of non-communicable diseases into other programmatic areas for the World Health Organization NCD working group using the experiences that we had learned. In May 2023, during the 17th Interest Conference in Maputo, Mozambique, we formed the HIV and Healthy Aging Working Group with the following foundation members. Dr. Barbara Castonovo, Dr. Andrew Kambungu, both from the Makerere University in Uganda, Dr. Nomotemba Chandiwana from the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa, and yours truly from the University of Ghana. And then, Mr. Luke Bodia, the Executive Director of the Society for AIDS in Africa, who is from the Republic of Benin, but we consider him a honorary Ghanaian because he's lived in Ghana for many years. This group is to champion HIV and healthy aging agenda and the auspices of International Conference of HIV AIDS and Sexually Transmitted Diseases in Africa. Now I want to talk about the HIV and health systems. A strong HIV program can only do well in a strong health system. And the building blocks of the health system include leadership and governance, the health system financing, health workforce, and service delivery, among others. Globally, the official development assistance for HIV from bilateral partners, apart from the US government, has actually declined. The World Bank projects that 52 countries, home to 43%, of people living with HIV who experienced a significant drop in the public spending capacity through to 2026. The role of domestic funding, domestic financing of HIV program will therefore become very crucial. Ghana must take urgent steps to increase its domestic contribution to HIV, not only to provide services to its people, but demonstrate its commitment to the national response. The approval and operationalization of the National AIDS Fund will be a step in the right direction. 
The overarching reason why I transitioned from Family Health International to join the University of Ghana was to dedicate efforts to build capacity of the next generation, next generation of uh, implementers and scientists in public health who use evidence-based approaches to solve the problems confronting us today. This goes beyond the ability to pass exams. Apart from the regular teaching in the School of Public Health, we have training and research grants and scholarships from the United States National Institute of Health, Fogarty International, the World Health Organization, the Human Reproduction Program that I lead in the School of Public Health, uh, that's, and it's, we, we serve as a hub for Anglophone Africa. And this offers to strengthen the program-related research and evaluation and seeks to give on hands-on training to our students. Again, using the interest platform that I serve as scientific chair, we raise funding to support 38 new African scientists yearly. This is through collaboration with Duke University Medical Center, Amsterdam Institute of Global Health and Development, and we receive funding from National Institute of Health and Fogarty International. These baby steps would help us develop the, uh, the next generation of African scientists that we truly desire. Now I want to us to look into the future, the future direction of HIV. We have come a long way in terms of HIV treatment. We have moved from roughly between six to 12 tablets a day to now one pill a day. And I remember in the early days when you prescribe the drug for the patient, it's almost like the patient having a meal. And like I said, we have made good progress and we are on the verge of treating our patients with a few injections a year. The use of long-acting agents. So long-acting agents basically are new drugs that we have on board that uh, you are giving once a month or once every two months. So currently we give most of our patients a tablet a day. The long-acting agents will allow us to give one injection every two months and then the patient will come and then take it. So evidence, the use of the long-acting agent actually is very, very interesting. Evidence from different trials. So we have the LATE 1 and 2 trials. The FLAIR and ATLAS studies have shown that long-acting agents, and the, the names are a bit heavy, so one of them is called Cabotegravir. Cabotegravir and Repivirin. These are administered either monthly or every two months. Now, Cabotegravir and Repivirin together is called Cabenuva. Now, Cabenuva was approved by the U.S. Uh, Food and Drugs Authority in January 2021 for two monthly dosing. There is also another drug called Lenacapavir. Lenacapavir is very exciting, and it was approved in the European Union and UK recently, that is in August 2022, for drug-resistant HIV. It belongs to the capsid inhibitor group. Now, Lenacapavir can be given six monthly. So once every six months, so Lenacapavir two times a year. So the future of HIV is very bright and the hope for twice a year treatment is on the horizon compared to the once a day treatment that we have today. The availability of long acting agents will require us as a country to start making changes in the health and community system to respond to these advances. Now I want to talk briefly about HIV vaccines. The story of vaccines for HIV has been a story of despair and hopelessness with the failure of many trials including the STEP, the Imbokodo, Uhambo, Mosaico, and Family Trials. The rapid development of COVID-19 vaccines by Pfizer and Moderna using the mRNA technology has given HIV vaccine development renewed hope. Moderna, using its mRNA platform, has designed two versions of mRNA 1644 for trials. It has been tested for safety in non-human subjects. Phase one of the study enrolled healthy vo human volunteers in the US. Following the safety and induction of immune response in 97% of the healthy adult US trial participants, this study is now being conducted, um, the, uh, this study is now being conducted in Rwanda and South Africa. This gives a lot of hope for the continent. Gene therapy is also an option 
that we explore for HIV cure. And actually, the Food and Drugs Authority in the U.S. has actually approved the first trial investigating gene editing as uh, HIV cure. So, to conclude, can we end AIDS in Africa? To get into the right trajectory to end AIDS in Africa, we need to attain the state of what we call epidemic control. Epidemic control is when the number of new infections is less than the number of deaths. So when the number of new infections is less than the number of deaths, then you start having a gradual decline in the number of persons who are infected with HIV. In 2022, West and Central Africa had 160,000 new HIV infections with 120,000 deaths. So again, there's a deficit of 40,000. East and Southern Africa had 500,000 new infections and 260,000 deaths. So again, there's a deficit of 240,000. So back home in Ghana, we had 16,574 new infections and then 9,509 deaths. So again, we also have a gap. However, there is hope. Countries like Iswatini, Botswana, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Zimbabwe have achieved their 95, 95, 95 targets, whilst eight other countries are on target. I must say with pride that Africa has recorded the steepest decline of HIV infections between 2010 to 2022, with East and Southern Africa actually recording 57% reduction of new infections and Western and Central Africa recording 49% compared to the average of 38% globally. There have been massive reductions in new infections in some countries. For example, Zimbabwe, Rwanda, Lesotho, Eritrea, Iswatini, Ethiopia, Burundi, and Cameroon. Despite this significant progress, the number of new infections remain unacceptably high. We will not end AIDS in 2030 if we maintain the current new infections. Ending AIDS in Africa is feasible, but we must aggressively cut down the new infections through combination prevention strategies, identifying and improving access to treatment for all populations, removing all structural barriers that limit access to treatment, and strengthening the community and health systems to respond to the evolving needs of the pandemic. Several countries in Africa have shown that ending HIV AIDS is possible. Achieving epidemic control requires systematic reduction of new infections in the African region. We must lift up our game in prevention, care, and treatment efforts on the continent. And to quote Albert Einstein, we cannot solve our problems with the same level of thinking that created them. We must innovate, demonstrate creativity, and commitment in this effort. Together, we can end it in our lifetime. Thank you. I want to acknowledge uh, a few people. First, I mentioned Dr. Edward Oladele. He came all the way from Zambia to be here with us in person. Edward, thank you. And then Dr. Um, Evelyn Ashuno, she also came from Kenya, and then she's also with us today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ashuno. <laughs> and I want to acknowledge my colleagues in the College of Health Sciences who gave me the necessary support as I transitioned from international development to a full-time academic. Firstly, Professor Richard Adanu, a past dean of the School of Public Health, who convinced me to take this leap of faith. Then also Professor Ankuma, my head of department at that time. And then to my provost, Professor Julius Fobiel, I call him the commander. I thank you for all the support that I received as head of department and as dean. These acts enabled me to adapt and flourish in academia. I also acknowledge Professor Binka, 
who received my initial application to join this university. I also want to thank the faculty, our administrator, and all the staff of the University of Ghana School of Public Health. And special thanks to Emerita Professor Isabella Kwachi and Professor Ayekumi. I'd also like to recognize uh, my research team, namely Dr. Samoaderi, Dr. Chris Guri, Dr. M. F. Amode, Dr. Adum Menu, Dr. Franklin Goza, Dr. Vicent Ganu, Dr. Caroline Baji, Emosa Preku, Derek Holbrook, Patience Thompson, and my main collaborators in Noguchi, Professor Ampofo and Dr. Evelyn Boni. For my teachers from the medical school, many of whom are still in the service of this great university, Professor Yaoko Okumi, who was not only my teacher, but a mentor and a friend. All my three children were born in his hospital, and he personally delivered two of them. He was not only a lecturer, um, he was not just only a lecturer, but a mentor, and he was one of the few who would give me money on Friday to just get a cold bottle of beer to distress the medical school. <laughs> Tough times. Professor Anyetel Asse, Professor Ncheche, Professor Yautete, Professor Edwin Redu, Professor Brichum, who is also here, Professor Adukwese, and many others. And special thanks goes to Professors Aaron Lawson, Professor CNB Tego, who is also here, Professor Seth Adite, and Professor David Oforeji. And I register my appreciation to Mr. Luke Bodea, who is the Executive Secretary for the Society for AIDS in Africa. He is actually giving us an alternate platform to broadcast this presentation across the Africa region. For my friends from St. Augustine's College, that is Absu 86, and Our Lady of Assumption Catholic Church, Anchor of Hope, Absu Hopsa Ola, and my classmates from medical school, that is the class of 1995, I will always appreciate your friendship and support. For my colleagues from the police hospital and FHI 360, the opportunities we had together set the foundations for my work today. To my parish priest from Ola, I thank you for your prayers and support and my health, heartfelt gratitude to the Akbalu family, uh, the Pepras, the Patins, and Awuye families. Your support and advice has always been invaluable. Now I really want to give special thanks to my mother, Mrs. Sophia Amufateke. She is the matriarch of the Topi family. She is an amazing woman who has completely transformed our immediate Topi family from the bottom of the pyramid to scholars, professionals, and others in less than two generations. Whether in Asante Bekwai, in Amansia East, in the Ashanti region, or Subin Hill, in Dunkwaofin, in the central region, or Aveime Bato, in the Volta region, her influence on us has been transformational. I remember when I gained admission to St. Augustine's in Cape Coast, she made several trips to Subin Hill, Dunkwanofi, to make sure that the Coco Krachi correctly documented the number of bags of cocoa that were sold to the Cocoa Marketing Board. This enabled me to earn the CMB scholarship for my secondary education in Cape Coast. My mother's devout Catholic roots Love for Mother Mary and prayers have helped us survive difficult stages in our lives. <laughs> the number of trips she made on the Accra Cape Coast Road to St. Augustine's and then to Kolebu is countless. I would forever remain grateful. To my late father, who unfortunately suffered heart attack in Zambia 15 years ago when he came to visit me. And he was due to return, I mean, two days before he was due to return, he just suffered heart attack and he died. He never saw the last phase of my professional career as an academic. May God bless his gentle soul. To my siblings, Mamiya, Alice, Malko, Kwabna, and Sister B, 
thank you for being there for me. To my uncle Herman, who is here, I appreciate your support you gave me when I needed most. That is in Cape Coast. <laughs> to my beautiful and lovely wife, Julia. <laughs> who I have known for 33 years since our Legon days. And, and, and we have been married for 23 years. She gave me a hard time in Legon, but finally agreed to marry me 10 years after I presented my manifesto. <laughs> you put your legal career on hold to take care of our children, helping our children in school whilst I travel around the world. You have been central to my success. My best friend and chief advisor, helping me navigate sensitive work situations in tough locations around the world. You taught me important lessons on being happy in life. The secret is a happy wife is a happy life. <laughs> to my children, Gianna, who is online, Keith, and Albert. Thank you for being very understanding as Daddy went on long trips or worked long hours. You are my unsung heroes. Your support and love is deeply appreciated. I love you all. Thank you. Now, I also want to acknowledge my numerous collaborators who have supported my research. There are many, many, many of them. You can see their logos there. And I'm really, really grateful for the support that you have. And I, I hope that uh, you continue to support us, that is the University of Ghana, in ending AIDS in our country and then in the rest of the continent. Now for, I also want to um, Acknowledge the Society for AIDS in Africa. They organize the HIV conference in Africa, that's ICASA. And uh, like I mentioned, they have actually given us an alternate platform with about 915 people who, are, who registered and are watching this program now. So the Society for AIDS in Africa, thank you. So the ICASA conference will take place in Zimbabwe from December 4th to 9th. And I encourage all of you who want to join the fight against HIV to try and attend. Thank you very much, and God bless you all. So thank you very much, Professor Kwesi Tope, um, for sharing your academic journey with us and especially your work on HIV and AIDS research. It's time for us to sit back, relax, and enjoy an interlude by the Ghana Dance Ensemble. This evening, the Ghana Dance Ensemble presents to us the Sohu dance. The dance is derived from two ever words, so meaning thunder and who meaning drum or dance performance. Therefore, the Sohu means standard dance among the other people. And this is a religious dance that um, is associated with the Yeve cult. The dance begins slowly with a sense of focus and devotion and then accelerates gradually into a fast-paced, vibrant dance. This dance is purposefully selected for this inaugural lecture. First, to reflect the ever lineage of Professor Tope, besides his Akan ancestry. Secondly, the dance teaches us that steadily, when one focuses on endeavor and devotes time to it, success becomes the end result. Therefore, Professor Tope set himself to work on health and its related subjects, and the end result of his hard work is what we are witnessing here today. Ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy the Sohu dance by the Ghana Dance Ensemble.
Thank you very much. So that was the Ghana Dance Ensemble with the Sohu Dance. It's time for us to make some presentations to our lecturer, and I would like to call forward the various groups that will be making presentations. Um, Professor Pei is in the School of Public Health, which is located in the College of Health Sciences. So the first to make their presentation is the College of Health Sciences. So please, if you are here, kindly come forward to make your presentation. Professor Tope is the Dean of the School of Public Health, so I'd now like to call the School of Public Health to come forward and make your presentation. School of Public Health. As they take their seats, please, the Department, uh, the Department of Population, Family and Reproductive Health, School of Public Health, please come forward. And as they make their way here, please, the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences, please, if you can kindly come forward. So immediately they are done, you do your presentation. And after that, the Department of Biostatistics, then the Department of Epidi Epidemiology and Disease Control, Department of Health Policy, Planning and Management. So if you can kindly come forward as they finish, you come up and make your presentation. <laughs> Department of Biological, Environment and Occupational, is that it? Social and Behavioral, so please go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. the Department of Biological
Department of Health Policy Planning and Management, have you come up already? Okay, thank you very much. So I think we've satisfied all the departments at the School of Public Health. Thank you. Department of Medicine and Therapeutics, if you are here, please kindly come forward to make your presentation. Department of Medicine and Therapeutics. Next is the Research Development Officers at the Ored Noguchi Satellite Office. If you are here, please kindly come forward. Security team, School of Public Health, please, you are next. Security team, School of Public Health. And please get ready. Junior staff, School of Public Health, senior staff, School of Public Health, you can come forward immediately after the security, then you do your presentation. Thank you. The School of Public Health is very well represented and they are all in their cloth. Please let's acknowledge them. Thank you very much, staff, School of Public Health. Next is the HIV COM RT cohorts one, two, and three. HIV COM RT cohorts one, two, and three. Please, if you are here, kindly come forward to do your presentation. As they come forward, please get ready. PhD cohorts four. <laughs> PhD cohorts four. Department of Population, Family, and Reproductive Health. Please get ready to do yours after this. Please get ready, IBBSS study team. IBBSS study team, please get ready. Dr. Evelyn Ashiono, Chief of Party, please, Kenya, if you are here, please kindly get ready to do the next presentation after this.
Gemnet Health, you are next. Gemnet Health, please, you are next.